thanks a lot. There's a, there's a handout going around. Um, I'm a relative newcomer to Mayasu, mostly, well, entirely thanks to Fabio and uh, Muhammad Hariri, uh, which again demonstrates that it's PhDs and postdocs that are the real lifeblood of our school of philosophy, and it's a continuing stream of new blood into the school. So in my case, this is one great example of it, getting these Fabio and Muhammad in to teach me a, a bit about Maya Sue. And I'm very interested in it. So this, I have some tentative things to say, but for me, they're just first steps into Maya Sue, and we'll see what you think. Okay. <coughs> Go on and fix it. So anyway, on the, we'll start with the handout and see if we can get that back. Um, so it just has two parts. One of them talks about correlationism and sellers, uh, and Kant and sellers, and then the second one talks about what sellers does with Kant's transcendental idealism. So you can see in the first section there, number one, um, whoops. Let's use this one. There we go. Okay, so Maya Su, he calls correlationism the contemporary opponent of any realism. Um, so that's going to be. Was there a slight delay on this, I guess? Okay. Transcendental philosophy, phenomenology, postmodernism, any, any anti-realism. It's a quote from uh, After Finitude. They all share the idea that there are no objects, no events, no laws, no beings, which are not always already correlated with a point of view with a subjective access. Um, in the end, by the way, I think it's important, these views of Mayasu on correlationism, even though I'm going to... Um, critically assess some of it. So transcendental correlationism in particular, um, Mayasu puts as um, there are universal forms of the subjective knowledge of things. Universal and emphasis on the subjective um, in the way that Mayasu glosses the transcendental. So one thing I want to ask is, is, is Kant's empirical realism correlationist in this sense? So I'll, I think, as I grapple with correlationism, that I would have to distinguish what I would call objective correlationism, which is where I want Kant's empirical realism to be, from uh, May Sue's often overly subjectivist correlationist readings of Kant, as I see it. He's got mixed readings of Kant throughout the book, as far as I can see. Okay. Um, so here's May Sue on uh, famous stuff uh, from After Finitude. I will call ancestral any reality anterior to the emergence of the human species. And then you get his notion of the RK fossil which are materials, for example, radioactive decay and so on, indicating such existence, that is, existence before the evolution, the emergence of the human species. And Mayasu has lots of rich discussions and classifications of different metaphysical ways of, um, of trying to have some sort of ancestral witness to cover these events, whether it's a god or absolute mind and so on. A lot of you will know more about that than I do. But for, uh, I like the emphasis he has that uh, on correla correlationism, not as a metaphysics, it's not supposed to hypostatize the, the correlation. Okay. Okay, but when he comes to portray his non-speculative Kantian correlationist opponent that he's going to oppose, um, he does so in terms of counterfactual constructions from some actual given experiences to cover gaps or lacunae in experience. And this is a particular way of looking at Kant. It's in the analytic tradition as well, where you have a sort of constructivist Kant from actual 
sensory experiences or then actual and possible sensory experiences. Um, and it's not quite the way I want to read uh, Kant's um, empirical realism. But having set it up that way, you know, so he's, he's asking, what about men on, uh, human beings on the other side of the moon in Kant? Well, you know, Kant includes that within possible experience. And Mayasu says, yeah, well, that's, that's true. Projecting from our actual experience, you can do various if-thens and say, if we were on the other side of the moon, we'd experience it. But uh, Mayasu is trying to argue that when push comes to shove, you have to have res reference to some actual historical subject. Uh, otherwise, the transcendental gets no embodiment. And it's that, I think, slightly misses something. OK. I think I forgot to read something there, so I'll go back to that. Um, so what Mayasu objects to in his way of reading Kant's correlationism um, he says it fails to address the ancestral that is anterior to givenness itself. Okay, so we're talking about something that you don't get to from some construction or counterfactual development from, from actual givenness. What about the very idea of anything prior to independent of givenness itself? So, um, Kant's empirical realism, this is me now, I think, uh, argues that any finite, temporally discursive, so you got some kind of sensibility, temporally, let's say, discursive, any finite concept user, any finite cognition of a world requires, or sure, let's say correlates with, I want to say correlates objectively with, certain forms of conceptual and sensory representation in general. Now Kant is very careful the way he abstracts these things so that um, he's, he's, he's doing a lot of work to specify things at different levels of abstraction such that we're talking about any finite being human or otherwise that's a concept user, well what's that? We gotta talk about that and that's sensorily receptive. What's that mean in general terms? It's not just human. Um, you could have beings that are atemporal, spatial. spatial. Carl Posey used to call them bats. Um, different forms of intuition, but still sensibly receptive. So Kant's empirical realism isn't based on gap-filling constructions from some actually given experiences, no matter how you finesse it. It's an analysis, and of course it starts from us, where else are we going to start? But it doesn't use as premises, premises about us. Okay, that's, that's crucial, I think. This is what I would we'll call, Kant, that I would think of as Kant's method of abstraction, not abstracting out, but abstracting from, so that he can talk about the self in a so-called disembodied way when he's only trying to make claims about its necessary relationship to any object doesn't mean he's asserting positively that the self is disembodied. He, he's abstracting from its embodiment for a certain argument at a certain level. Okay, so I think Mayasu's anti court when did I start, by the way? Let's call it quarter two, um, and I'll go about 45 minutes. So I think Mayasu's anti-correlationist point that actual, here's Mayasu, givenness could just as well never have emerged, it doesn't succeed in presenting a problem for Kant's analysis. He doesn't have a problem with that. I mean, he's the guy that had hypotheses about the origin of the solar system before there were human beings. He's doing an analysis that's not dependent on the actual genesis of givenness. He's dependent, it's dependent on an abstract characterization of sensible givenness in general. The ancestral stuff doesn't touch Kant. Uh, I think that's right, although I don't want to be dogmatic because I'm a newcomer to Mayasu. And I think there are other aspects of Mayasu's book from what I'm learning that don't rely on that argument. So I still think he presents interesting challenges, even if this bit I, I, I have difficulty with thinking that he's got Kant right on this. So Mayasu thinks that since Kant's transcendental subject is non-metaphysical and requires embodiment, both of those are right, I think. It's not the posit of a metaphysical soul or subject, and Kant's self-thinking self does require embodiment. <clears throat> 
He infers, therefore, Kant's correlationist arguments concerning the necessary forms of any self-conscious finite cognition depend essentially on premises concerning the historical emergence of subjects. And that's false. For example, on facts such as, quote, from Mayasu, the emergence of living bodies, that is to say, the emergence of the conditions for the taking place of the transcendental. I, I don't agree with, uh, with his take on Kant on these, in these respects. What I call objective, Kant's objective correlationism and his empirical realism doesn't have those kind of premises. It has those kinds of applications. I mean, if Kant's story is right, then there are available gap-filling laws, but they're objective laws, and they're not based on an argument that has to do with finite historical emergence of, of givenness or of thinking. So that's, that's how I see it anyway. So I think Kant's formal method, I've been babbling on about this, um, for example, in the transcendental deduction, the possibility of the I think being correlated with, I mean, it's a nice term, but it's fine, with uh, the validity of objectivity concepts. That correlation is going to be a conceptual analysis, though, of course. It's not going to be a correlation of independent givens, but uh, that's fine. I think Mayasu understands that from what I've read. I think Kant is the master of abstraction at different levels, not reifying the abstract characterization. This is true in the moral philosophy, too. You get this disembodied subject with no feelings. But there are further necessary conditions that he deals with elsewhere in his later the uh, theory of virtue, for instance. So I think that Kant's um, method involves abstraction without reifying the disembodied abstractions he's dealing with, showing there are a sequence of necessary, con conceptually necessary conditions that follow from it. So you get the transcendental deduction very general, the I think and an objective world. Then you get the analogies, it's an objective world in time. Then you get the refutation of idealism, it's an objective world in space. Then you get the regular maxims in the appendix, and it's an objective world in space with uh, empirically rich, available um, concepts and kinds, and so on and so forth. And that's what I'm arguing here, basically repeating what I just said. So material embodiment comes in, that's right. But it it's doesn't come in as a premise. It comes in as a further necessary condition for the sorts of things that he's been arguing there have to be at various levels. So it turns out you need empirical concepts, empirical laws. How, you know, those are going to be the proper instanti instantiations of the transcendental principles, like the second analogy. What does the second analogy get to be applied to if not to such things as that copper conducts electricity? That's the sort of necessitation. That contingent natural law is the sort of thing that instantiates the second analogies. Every event must have a cause. So Kant, my Kant lives in a rich empirical world filled with contingencies, but these arguments delineate various conceptually necessary truths within any such world in general. Now, um, this is just something I want to think about further, but um, those of you who know may assume stuff better than I do know a lot about Hume's problem and about the, the um, necessity of laws, as he calls it. Um, one thing I think about Kant is he doesn't hold that the laws of nature are necessary. There's at least one sense in which he doesn't hold that. It's a crucial sense. There could have been other laws of nature, Kant holds. Um, he says this in the third critique, in effect. He sort of says, um, uh, well, let me, let me show you how I spell it out here. So suppose, no, look, doesn't Kant at least hold that it's necessary that there are forces of attraction and, and repulsion in nature? Yes, he does hold that that is necessary, but note that that's based on a contingent premise he holds, the experience of motion in our world, which might not be the same in other worlds. That's the preface to the metaphysical foundations of natural science. I mean, the first critique can't in conclude that there are forces of attraction and repulsion in nature, even if he says it in some various places. He himself will correct that and say, look, strictly, strictly what I can give you are the analogies and so on. And then if you give me motion, because how else are things going to affect our senses, 
then I'll give you that there has, our world has to be a natural world of forces of attraction and repulsion. So that's contingent in that very high level respect. Then he does think he can entail a lot of, you know, a lot of things can be derived about nature. But Newton's laws are discovered as well. Newton's particular laws uh, don't just get spun out of Kant's head, he doesn't think. Um, even with Michael Friedman's fascinating things about the development of these, I don't think, you know, N Newton's mathematical laws of physics are discoveries, Kant holds, the particular mathematical laws. And then, I th it's most interestingly, all empirical causal laws in general then aren't in this model of, of the Newtonian physics that itself is contingent in various ways. Um, all the empirical, the rest of all our ongoing discoveries are entirely contingent for Kant. They're governed by regulative maxims. Where does Kant address the problem of induction that May is concerned with? Not in the second analogy. Second analogy is a necessary condition for the sorts of reasonable hypotheses in, the, in Kant's accounts in the third critique and in the appendix to the dialectic, um, where Kant takes science to be an ongoing, contingent generation of hypotheses that are tested and refuted and so on. So, that, I, you know, how that will bear, maybe Mayasu, maybe that's his Kant too, but I don't think so from, from the bits I've read. So what's necessary for possible experience, now maybe this is all Mayasu needs by way of commitment to do what he wants to do, and that's fine. What's necessary for possible experience for Kant is that there exist some causal laws of nature or other discoverable by experience contingently such that, and here's the strong bit, um, any given kind of event is causally necessitated by some interior kind of event. Kant holds that. But that's it. There's, we don't know what sorts of determinism will hold throughout nature in the third critique. Kant says, we hope that we could find a unified theory of all of nature under physical laws of one hierarchical kind, but we could just as well end up discovering not so. But if we don't discover any kind of necessitation that we can have, any kind of intelligible before and after that we can give some kind of modality to as necessary, then it's true we'd have um, um, an experience that doesn't hang together. So I think this is, but this, uh, you know, I want to look more into Mayasu on this to see um, if this really damages his project, but this is a very different Kant from Mayasu's Kant, I think. Still, the important thing I get out of Mayasu for my own thinking is, is he's right. You know, there is Kant's objective, formal, empirical realism is correlationist in the way I've spelled it out. It's not subjectively correlationist as I want to see it. It's not historically dependent on the, in the way he says. It doesn't depend on the necessity of physical laws in ways he seems to assume. But he's right. It is, in a sense, correlationist relative to other views. What other views? Well, OK, let me try this instead. Yeah, I, I, I can't claim any expertise or, or adequate knowledge yet of, of Mayasu, but from after finitude I've been reading, you know, his speculative materialism is designed uh, it's to work its way through Kant's view to a non-correlationist speculative realism. What I'm not, you know, I've read his stuff about Cantor and how he wants to get to his intellectually intuitionist, rationalist, mathematizable conception of how we do know reality, but I take it one thing it's supposed to be is non-correlationist and to get beyond correlationist views, whereas my views are going to end up correlationist to the end in this objectively correlationist way, in a way I take to be, as we'll see, consistent with scientific realism. You know, there are, there are going to be a lot of things where the sort of correlationism I'm, I'm going to find in Kant and Sellers and that I find plausible, an empirically realist objective correlationism, um, is going to involve rejecting certain kinds of realism. Mayasu's possibly 
seems that way on my first acquaintances with it. Um, views that might say that reference is determined on causal grounds alone without any necessary conceptual conditions. You know, if, if your realism is based on reference relations that are based on pure modal experiments without any epistemology of how social conceptual cognition tracks those things, then I think there's more work to be done. It's not that, you know, a causal theory of reference is fine, but uh, the sort of Kantian correlationism I find plausible is going to have um, more epistemic tra uh, governance, if you will. It's going to have an account of what we're doing in inquiry in, instead of just relying on modal thought experiments to say Nixon might not have been so-and-so and still be Nixon. I don't expect that to be clear, but maybe some people will know what I'm on about. Other kinds of realism that rely on, you know, it used to be that you'd define realism in the analytic tradition uh, in terms of, um, uh, well, you, my teacher Bill Lichen used to anyway, it's basically you just think it's fine that we could be brains in a bat, it's just a bad hypothesis. It's perfectly intelligible. The way you define that kind of strong realism or Barry Stroud or um, is that yes, we could conceivably be in the Cartesian situation, we're just not. And it, it, it's a bad hypothesis. I mean, well, actually, that's a, you know, it's the old view that uh, it takes explanationism, which I like, and applies it to these deepest of questions and says it's a bad explanation that we're brains and bats. I just, you know, I think the sort of cons correlationism that I find plausible being that kind of Kantian, which I think Sellers is too, doesn't rely on that kind of defense. The intelligibility. And, and obviously, intuitionist rationalism, and this is where I think perhaps Mayasu would also fall under, um, is ins insufficiently grounded in the sensible and conceptual sorts of conditions for cognition that I think are plausible. And, and I think Sellers does too. Okay. So, let's let correlationism refer to a Kantian empirical realist, an objective Kantian empirical realism of the sorts I want to say. It's, correl it's correlationist because it says any knowledge of any world with objects in it does correlate with certain kinds of highly abstractly characterized conceptual and sensory conditions. But, and was Sellers a correlationist in that sense? I, I say yes. He was a Kantian empirical realist. I mean, we could, we could go on about that. I do go on about that elsewhere, but that's, I think, Kant, that Sellers was a Kantian empirical realist of that kind. But what about his scientific realism? Now, here's where there are interesting comparisons with Mayasu that Fabio spelled out, and, um, but there, are, you know, I want to say there's differences between Mayasu and Sellers' Persianism such that Sellers is still more of a Kantian, even in the scientific realist phase. So here, here's the bit, the well-known bit about Kant's transcendental idealism. The manifest image, MI ontology of ordinary objects is ultimately false. I'll keep talking about object ontology, because Kant, of course, I mean, Sellers, I keep saying Kant, Sellers. Sellers wants to unify the manifest image and the scientific image so that they both come out true. But the way he does it is that the object ontology of the manifest image is false. Science gives you the right story of objects. It's the account of persons and norms and values, all of those functional normative realities, crucially persons, that survives as true in the manifest image right into the scientific image on my reading. So, but it's the object ontology that's ultimately false, the, the world of colored dry goods and so on. So it might seem that Seller's story of the manifest image and the scientific image fits with uh, Mayasu's anti-correlationist speculative materialist outlook. And there are interesting comparisons, as Fabio pointed out. And, um, but I think the differences are strong as well, as Fabio also pointed out. I mean, Seller's Persian scientific realism demands um, now, each of the things I'm about to say, someone might say, Mayasu demands the same thing, and that's fine. I'd be interested to see the ways in which he does it with his rationalist intuitionism. 
the way that I think Sellers does it in his Persian way is more Kantian. Um, it demands successful cross-framework explanatory -tory reconceptualization. What's that mean? When you got Einstein's concept of mass, you have to explain and model Newton's concept of mass and say why it succeeded and why it failed to the extent that it did in Einstein's terms. I mean, it's all conceptually intelligible for Sellers, and it has to be made conceptually intelligible. Um, and the Sellers' whole account of truth is, concept, is conceptual framework relative, that is true in which framework, and then we form the idea of the ideal, regulative ideal of a explanatorily complete framework, but that doesn't come as some end out of nowhere that swings free of all these conceptual practices. It's defined in terms of the conceptual practices. Do that thing you did with Einstein and Newton, where you reconceive Newton's theory within Einstein's theory, and picture that extended indefinitely. So it's all constrained epistemically in these ways, or so I say. The object ontology is wide open. It can be as chaotic as you like. But it'll have to have a backwards tracing genealogy in terms of um, each successive phase explaining conceptually the earlier phase. Um, picturing doesn't swing free of this. Picturing is non-conceptual but governed by conceptual norm. It's it, the reason you get intelligible pictures of reality and science is because of the sorts of conceptual practices I've described below. I can talk more about that. Picturing doesn't swing free in human inquiry. Animals picture in their way because they have an analog derived from evolution of what our conceptual practices are. So you're not going to get something swinging free of the conceptual and the Kantian by appealing to picture. So I take both Kant and Sellers to be objective correlationists of the Kantian empirical realist variety. I take Sellers' Persian scientific realism to be governed by broadly Kantian cross-framework epistemic constraints such that it's not anti-correlationist in QM's desired speculative way. And Sellers would also hold those things about reference, a purely causal theory that does, isn't governed by conceptual constraints won't do. He has the same things about brain and a vat. He always deals with those things in terms of projecting cross frameworks and so on. So happy with objective conceptual Kantian correlationism in both Sellers' empirical realism and his uh, scientific realism, it seems to me. So uh, Sellers' uses of Kant's transcendental idealism. What should we say about that? There's, and now comes some bits where there's going to be some parts of Sellers I'll depart, leave behind some, but the main thrust keep in a way that I think does keep the main thrust of Kant and Sellers, and it leaves two things that I reject in, in Sellers. Um, first of all, transcendental idealism, everyone will know, that is interpreted, there, is said in many ways, as Aristotle says. Um, the main continental style, no, I'm no expert on the main continental style, but it often seems to me to be a highly subjective correlationist reading of Kant's transcendental idealism, which is perfectly fine. So, so is it in the analytic tradition um, uh, and in, in the tradition, in both traditions. Um, but there are objective correlationist readings of Kant's transcendental idealism that assimilate tightly what Kant is saying about space and time as crucially involving this method of abstraction where you abstract from the understanding's commitments in order to try to say some things in the transcendental aesthetic, but it turns out the transcendental aesthetic can't do what it wants to do if, unless the conceptual conditions are brought in and the an transcendental analytic, and you get um, um, a much happier story from my perspective of transcendental idealism, but the nice thing here is I, uh, I don't care for my purposes, which of those is true. Um, either way, let's talk about Kant's empirical realism in the ways I've been describing. That is, 
if you're Paul Geyer or Strassen and you hate transcendental idealism and it's subjectively correlationist, but yay, objective kinds of kind of objectivity and so on, that's fine with me. And also, yay, these views that say, no, you've misinterpreted Kant's transcendental idealism. It's more objectively correlations. Fine. I'm, I'm happy either way. Not, and on the matter of Kant interpretation, it's a, it's a serious matter. But not in the matter of what I want to do here. OK. So Seller's main transcendental idealist theme is that thing up in seven. Um, where the M manifest image is the world of appearances, scientific image is the world of noumena, replace Kant's God with theoretically postulated scientific objects, regard the manifest image object ontology as, strictly speaking, false, point out that persons remain in both images because persons aren't objects. It, once again, it's not to say that persons aren't also objects. It's, can't get stick with that method of abstraction from. Uh, yes, they are also objects, but they're not essentially what persons are, are the same sorts of things that norms and statuses are with regard to their thinking capacities, which is crucial for their perceptual and volitional capacities for Kant. So, but Kant, uh, Kant it, it sometimes people forget, Sellers rejects Kant's arguments for transcendental idealism. There's one in chapter two of Science and Metaphysics where he's a lot like Geyer and says Kant, um, Sellers just mentions it in a sentence, says there's probably modal fallacies in Kant's arguments from geometry to try to include to um, uh, transcendental idealism, um, that, that geometry can't apply to things in themselves, probably involves mo certain modal errors, and those of you that know Paul Geyer, he argues in that way. Um, the categories, it, this is important. The, the very idea of an objective conceptual correlationism, Seller says, doesn't entail transcendental idealism. He says that you might think just because we necessarily categorize things as F, that F only pertains to us, not to things in themselves. But Seller says, that's an interesting question. But no, things could be the way we necessarily categorize them and be the way that things are, Seller says. So all the classic moves for Kant's transcendental idealism, Sellers rejects. Um, and crucially, I want to point out, he doesn't take Kant's objective conceptual correlationism to, uh, put it in Mayasu's terms, to entail transcendental idealism. Kant's empirical realism could be real realism, real ultimate realism. Yeah. Now, here's a big, big thing that's not on the handout. I, I just interesting from, because I think I'm doing okay on time, right? I got, I've used about half hour. Um, here's Sellers, interesting, let me just read it. Science and Metaphysics, Chapter 6, 54. If we take the position that concepts pertaining to microphysical objects are merely conceptual instruments, of course, they're at least that. Now, this is instrumentalism, which Sellers rejects, and I reject. Even Brandon McDowell Rorty reject. If you're an instrumentalist, if that were true, then the world as we perceive it, the manifest image or the Kantian world of appearances for Sellers, um, is unthreatened. Our philosophy will be essentially Aristotelian, and we can say of the Aristotelian world of contemporary Aristotelians, such as P.F. Strassen, that it exists not only as something represented, but also in itself. There's nothing wrong with being necessarily represented and that being the world of appearances. That's Kant's correlationism, his empirical realism. If that were adequate, then it's adequate, and it pictures the way things are in themselves for sellers. It just happens to be the case he has independent arguments to say it's inadequate. I mean, it's like, there's a lot to be said about that, well, how the manifest image for him has the seeds of its own breakdown. But that's, it's, so let's continue. According to our analysis, this would mean that basic singular statements in this Strassonian framework would picture or depict objects in a way which is, in principle, adequate. 
Persian final truths would be in Strassonian terms. No problem if that were true. For as we've seen, although though truth does not admit of degrees, adequacy of picturing does, depicting. And now this and is a but, really, but, but if there were reason to think that basic singular statements in the language of theoretical physics would depict the world and in a more adequate way, this would of itself be reason to characterize that language as one which, other things being equal, we should use to speak about the world and the cor corresponding framework of conceptual representings to think about the world and in particular to represent the objects of perception. If future theoretical physics were the more adequate, which Sellers believes is the more adequate way of depicting the world, then that's the language that we would use in philosophy and in ordinary life and so on. So my point here is that Sellers' view of conceptual cognition, his Kantian empirical realism, does not immediately entail transcendental idealism. I used to have our, uh, friendly arguments with Bill DeVries about this. It, and I think, I think Bill would agree, that's it, well, at least I say, Sellers holds that there's nothing in the objective conceptual correlationism of a Kantian empirical realism that entails transcendental idealism. It's other arguments, so let's see what those other arguments are for Sellers. So I say Sellers defends a Kantian empirical realism in all its epistemic principles. The grounds for Sellers' transcendental idealism, which is the falsity of the object ontology of the manifest image, rests on two non-Kantian arguments, neither of which I find convincing, but these are interesting issues. First one has to do with the ultimate homogeneous, you know, it's qualia stuff. I don't, wouldn't use the term qualia for sellers because people in philosophy of mind mix in all kinds of epistemic um, Thomas Nagel type things into their qualia, but um, sellers has qualia file issues in the, in the contemporary philosophy of mind. The ultimate homogeneity of sensible qualities allegedly requires their wholesale ontological, this isn't a Slarzian term, relocation, that's David Rosenthal, to the perceiver in a way that ultimately entails the falsity of MI's manifest images, ordinary object ontology of persisting colored physical. I mean, he's a Lockean Galilean in a much more sophisticated way than they were, but that's the story at the end of the day. The color that the yellow banana has is in us and then it has to be reconceived. It's, a, it's the shape as well. Um, and the question is whether that is, there's certain things that aren't, uh, well, just, I'll get to it. I, you know, the problem of sensory consciousness and qualia is, is extremely difficult, but whether it entails the wholesale falsity of the manifest image and the relocation of colored shaped items to be reconceived analogically as states the perceiver such that it's false, ultimately, that there are colored persisting objects out there. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't agree with that. And the second type of argument's very different, however, Feyerabend, Kuhn-style ontological replacement models. That's like that we're living in a different world. This I find plausible with regard to Newtonian mass and Einsteinian mass. The world simply contains nothing answering to Newtonian mass. Strictly speaking, uh, it approximates and can be explained by Einsteinian mass. But why think that generalizes across all domains? I don't even think Kant's father, Roy Wood, would have said that. Why think that by the best I can do for Sellers and tried to do in my book is that all the higher level special sciences involve predictive stances and the only real objects are the ones of ultimate physics. I see no reason to, to, to think that that model generalizes to all, generalizes across biology, gives us reason to think that animals don't really exist, strictly speaking, and so on. There are different ways of doing science in different domains. Scientific realism about physical particles does not require generalizing in that way. So I'm a skeptic about that, and I don't see that as being a skeptic. I, I see that as mainline contemporary scientific realist philosophy. I think Sellers has a bit of lingering physicalism in ways that one doesn't need in order to be a physicalist. One can be a physicalist without having that kind of, on one can have a more layered ontology and not reject 
manifest image objects, or so I say. So I think we can reject those two things, but hold something close to them, which I find plausible. The first is preserving everything that's in the spirit of cell. Is its whole thing was to say, we can do cognitive science, talk about subconscious, robust, uh, non-conceptual sensory representations that track the world. And we can do all this without losing our conceptual correlationism. Without, while being Kantians and later Wittgensteinians, we can, Sellers was making the world safe for robust accounts of sensory representation of the sort that are anathema to Rorty Brandom and McDowell. But we can defend Sellers on that. He, he like Kant in many ways, was showing how you can integrate a story of non-conceptual sensory representation into that kind of conceptualism. They're not incompatible. And I find that an exciting project in all these thinkers. Um, there's aspects of it I've seen in Ken Westfall anyway with regard to the reading of Kant and so on. Um, I don't see why you need to um, hold that there are no colored persisting bananas ultimately to hold that. Now, you can finesse that, and you can say, of course, we assert within the manifest image framework that there are colored persisting objects. But Sellers is quite f firm. What he means by transcendental idealism is there are no objects such as the manifest image talks of. They do not exist, per se. And I think that's more than one needs to hold to have a theory of sensible representation in these ways. Never mind disjunctivism. I mean, if, if, if one drinks the elixir of disjunctivism, one can, uh, but I, I think that's not on Seller's map. I'm not particularly attracted to those views because I don't think they do enough to explain sensory representation, but um, Seller's option is not, does not have to be the first option that comes to mind on the problem of sensory consciousness, and I don't think to be a physicalist one needs to be that kind of physicalist, and one can have a more hierarchical scientific naturalism and realism. It's what I, th what I think. So the second one is one can have a self-correcting scientific realist outlook about theoretical entities within the Kantian empirical realist outlook. Kant was a, was a realist about theoretical ent entities within the Kantian realist outlook, I think. David Landy has a new book where he's very Solarzine about the view of sensory um, cognition in Kant, sensible intuition, um, and makes that same move and says Seller's scientific realism can be defended within the manifest image world of um, in Kant's empirical realism. Okay, so we don't have to have an a, a priori argument for the generalized ultimate falsity of all manifest image object ontology, I, I think. Okay, I'll be finishing up soon now. So the resulting outlook would be objectively correlationist throughout. And with Sellers, we should hold there's nothing about a conceptually correlationist empirical realism of this kind that entails a subjectively correlationist transcendental idealism. It doesn't. Um, but against Sellers, I would replace A and B as those strong claims with A star and B star. I'm happy to happy to have non-conceptual, and um, look, after all, in both of these things, Sellers, in a sense, generalizes in a way that we should leave open to inquiry, I think. I see myself as being more Persian in this way. I'm happy to investigate non-conceptual sensory representations. I don't see in my armchair concluding the sorts of things Sellers does about the ultimate place of color and the falsity of the manifest image ontology. And uh, I'm sure I'm happy with Kuhn and Fire Robin, but I don't want to take them everywhere I go. So overall, put polemically, if this is a form of anti-realism, it's only anti the sorts of epistemically unhinged realisms. That is Maya Su's one, and I'll have to read more. It's, it's looking, I don't know yet, um, <laughs> that flout the sorts of generically abstract, objectively correlationist conceptual conditions 
that are articulated in, in Kant's empirical reason. I mean, I hesitate about Meisu there because the way, you know, Fabio articulates it, he wants to be able to maintain that there are conceptual conditions for his sort of mathematical rationalist realism. So, you know, I have to look more carefully to say anything careful about Meisu's positive story. So I think Seller's Kantian realist philosophy was just of that kind, a Kantian empirical realism. But I think we can hold that along with Seller's scientific realism. And when we reject certain strong claims of A and B kind, um, I, I think we end up with a view that's both, uh, it's a kind of Kantian naturalism that Sellers did more than anyone to, to inspire. And that's all, folks. <laughs> Yeah, Ken. Um, first, thank you very much. Uh, and we're very, very much on the same page. I want to pick up your last remark about being perceived this way. Yeah. Because I think you're right, but there's been this popularization of Kersian truth that is a disaster in just the way Melissa Hill is complaining about. Mainly, if you take his remarks, about truth being the ultimate outcome of scientific inquiry as defining what truth is, then you're on, you know, then you're within Mills's target zone for the kinds of correlationism that lead in really bad directions, right? But Purse's remarks were not a definition and they were not offered as a definition mm. and they rely on um, what is proving to be an ever more optimistic presumption that people will be reasonable enough to actually pay attention to cogent evidence and analysis offered by responsible scientists and come ultimately hmm. to find that evidence sufficient for whatever is ultimately accepted. And so it's not a definition of truth. And, and, and probably not in, and not in Sellers uh, either, in a way. Oh, it's a, yeah. I wouldn't expect Sellers to have treated Peirce that way, but yeah. he does get taken that way by people like yeah. Brandon and Putnam. I mean, it's interesting to see what you say about then Sellers on, because I think you're probably right for Sellers, too, that he's not defining yeah. truth. He's yeah. defining um, adequacy of picturing and truth is correspondence in this way perhaps but not truth which has a more generic um, for him a certableist uh, or permission license to disquote kind of definition um, across all frameworks okay yeah I think that the term subjective and objective correlation is a lot about Mm -hmm. But I think what you're getting at with it is, is fine. And I think perhaps the, the better way of that ASU deals with Kant's correlationism, which fits into this, these um, discussions about, say, truth and semantic discernibility, is this criticism that essentially what Kant calls objective validity is. Objective validity, well, yeah. It's actually in subjective. That's right. What Mayasu is like kind of really kind of harsh critique. But I think he's basically right, is that essentially what Kant ends up doing in trying to explain how it's possible that we can have objectively valid truth, which is to say a judgment that is true that in the right kind of way, right, right is to actually um, reduce that standard from some kind of strong objectivity to something slightly weaker. The thing is, if you, I mean, I have no sense, no problem with um, making objective correlationism depend on certain things about cognition in the most abstract terms, but when you when you say intersubjective, do you mean in a way that is going to entail those historical sorts of premises no, and so on? Really. I, I just mean I, I just just the word of the subjective is very loaded. I mean it's simply in terms of this. There's a sense in which the standard gets weaker and more relevant. Right. But, but suppose you take, I'll admit, in a sense, it's weaker relative to certain kinds of realism that are 
the ones that I would reject. But if you take the highly abstract characterization of a certain kind of thinker using concepts sensibly affected, and you define what truth is as correspondence in a way that hangs together with that, that gets you into subjectivity, so to speak, for any subject that's like that, human or non-human. But if you define it in terms of intersubjectivity, that could be a different game. I mean, I'm again dropping the word intersubjectivity. The mm -hmm. point is, it's about the norm of the standard, right? Yeah. And precisely the account of sellers that you're providing is that, in fact, sellers does he's, have a stronger norm of the standard than can. That it, like he, he's, he's willing to accept that there is something like. Um, the objective validity of the empirically real framework. So does um, Kant. Yeah, that, they're both willing to accept that. But for Kant, the, the noumenal standard that's distinct from that is completely inaccessible. It's got no, we've got no purchase on it whatsoever. The only thing that has purchase on that is intellectual intuition, maybe. No, I, mean, well, I, I wouldn't go that way. I'd say it's only our... It can't completely demetaphysicizes the, the noumenal and turns it into practical commitments. But, but aside from that, I think where you're leading up is I reject, the part of sellers I reject rejects the equation of, thing, of what science gets at with noumenalism. We shouldn't, we shouldn't, once we no longer have the generalized falsity of the manifest image, we no longer think that there's some if you look at all of Sella's arguments about scientific realism and progression, it's all, as it were, constrained by internal conce Kantian conceptually correlationist stuff. It's loose. It, it's the only arguments that get you the need for some other noumenal standard are the ones that I reject. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to say that there's a noumenal standard, yeah. but rather that there is a standard. There is a, there is a, there is a, there is a kind of split between types of semantic assertability, such that the standard of the manifest image is a genuine standard and it's good enough for most purposes. But there's also there's also a standard beyond to which we can appeal in, in terms of the unification of, of yeah. scientific theories dealing with. But the only reason I keep coming back at you is because, see, I want to assimilate Seller's scientific realism to the first standard. I want to say, when 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 Sellers is talking about what science does, he's not talking about things other than the sorts of things we do in the manifest image, um, which is why he says the scientific image grows out of the thing. There, there's only, science postulates unobservables, but even that um, isn't a problem for the picture I'm giving where the sorts of standards that are in the scientific image are the same as the sorts of standards in the manifest image. It's only when he then says the fact that there are these imperceptible particles is incompatible with the claim that there are also ordinary colored objects. That, two, that Eddington's two tables, there's only two ways to deal with it. It's falsity, the manifest table, or being an instrumentalist. That's it for sellers. That's it. And that's not it. For me, those aren't the only two options that the man. So I think the, where is it that section in EPM where he talks about how um, we've always used scientific, uh, you know, is it like part nine or ten, where he says um, the scientific image is an outgrowth of the manifest image that we've always done this kind of hypothetical abductive reasoning. The only thing that gets sellers into the falsity of the manifest image, and therefore it's seeming like science is something different, I say is um, those arguments I reject. I, I see where you're coming from. I think, yeah. there's, I think there's further things to be pursued. But yeah. Some of these get into problems with sellers. And so like the this whole point in the um, philosophy of the scientific image in land yeah. about principles not being conserved between the scientific and manifest image, but variables being conserved, right, is precisely you mean the thing about laws versus the reference of the, yeah, I mean, he's yeah. got, that's why I said the best I can do for Sellers is for his strong physicalism is to say that the things we refer to, say, I'm, I'm, you know, apples that are colored and so on, or animals, biological entities, 
is to say that they're ultimately made of these physical constituents, and then to say that the laws by which you mean the principles, those don't get reduced away. But I just, uh, I, yeah, I don't hold that, but I guess I'm more, the special sciences come with a certain ontology, not just, you, you can't separate laws from ontology that neatly, from kinds, as Kant taught us in well, the appendix. It's all about the mappings between the models to work in the way Stellas wants to make them work. Like, you're not going to get mappings between the different special sciences, which preserve, like, ontology in the sense of, like, the, the domain of reference, right? But that doesn't mean that the mappings aren't good. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean that. I'm, I'm, and actually, here's the moral for me. On one thing is, I'm willing to be entirely um, Percy and open-ended in the road of inquiry about how good a job can we do with scientific unification to explain the manifest image without this kind of a priori argument that just claims it's false based on, but but based on actually explaining. But that's the work, sort of, well, anyway, I, so I can see, I see myself being Persian and less a priori in the sorts of places that Sellers should have been in, at that, that point. Those are very interesting questions. There was another question. Somewhere. Someone had another one. Yep. Philip. Yeah, Mahal. So, thanks for the talk. Mm -hmm. uh, Another direction from Kent's uh, comment. Uh, so, in Dynamics of Reason, uh, Michael Friedman says that there's three aspects that kind of uh, keep scientific inquiry realistic. The, for, as you mentioned, two of them versus continuity from framework to framework, so Newtonian mass to be accounted for within Einstein. Uh, the second, he says, is uh, it doesn't, doesn't matter what it is. The one that he, he mentions, the third one, which is interesting, he says that it's very important to realize that inquiry is inherently contingent, meaning that science can go in any direction. Mm -hmm. It's not fixed. And that's a point that Ken made that no, the purse wasn't defining some final truth that we're supposed to eventually get, or even postulating it. Uh, but I'm wondering, so this is something I'm going to mention in my talk on Friday, but here, Friedman says we have to be wary of the contingency of theoretical, uh, of theorization, scientific theorization. And unless you have that bad picture of purse, I think, I just want to know what you think of this, how Sellers maybe fits into this. But unless you have that bad picture of purse, uh, may Sue's jumping towards contingency, or the contingency of laws, or the, just the apparent stability of laws, seems to be accounted for, or let's say, um, entertained more nicely from, from, from inside the corner. The mm. idea that we don't really know where scientific theorization is going. Uh, the laws could be quite different yeah. depending on where reasonable discussion takes us later. Mm. Ah, that was a second reasonable discussion. Uh, but, what is it? but then, still here, I'm tempted to go with May Su. This is the last thing I'll say before I let you speak. Um, May Su insists that there's something about Kant, which assumes that there's a stability in the universe, ontologically. It has to be stable. Uh, whatever laws turn out to be, even if things seem unstable now, there might be laws later that mm -hmm. will show us an inner stability. Well, that, yeah, I wouldn't say he says that, but go, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, but that's what... I'm with you. I'm with you all so far, yeah. That's what, that's what they... So he says we have to be able to say, well, look, the conditions of consciousness are not the same as the conditions of science. So science could fail, but we could still perceive the world. He talks about this in his science fiction book. Mm. And, and, and there, he's, he really wants to stress the idea that it's not just a contingency about where scientific discovery will go, but like the world will literally maybe change and push scientific discovery in a different direction. Yeah. And I don't know if this kind of imaginary kind of consciousness that, that Meisu tries to push sometimes is likable for Solarzy or Kantian or, or, or how it fits. I don't know, it's not really a question. No, there's a lot in there. So. I like some, when I read Dyna Michael Friedman's Dynamics of Reason, I mean, in many ways he says a lot of things that Sellers already says about the synthetic a priori, that there's, um, uh, Friedman kind of says, um, 
at any given stage, I'm trying to remember now, but at any given stage, there's nothing that's synthetic. Like C.I. Lewis said, there's nothing that's a priori. Um, our a priori categorizations change over time. And Friedman says, but there's something right about the Kantian sort of view that there are conceptual, sensory, cognitive conditions, certain kinds of principled conditions that, as it were, are neither just merely analytic, you have to tweak Lewis there, or um, purely observational, but are <coughs> sort of relativized synthetic a priori principles, as it were, relatively a priori within a framework that make that framework's empirical inquiry possible. You know, roughly, if you're in a Kuhnian paradigm, there's going to be broadly Kantian relativized, pragmatically accounted for principles that are necessary to explain how mathematics gets application in physics within that framework. And I think that's a good way to spell out what Sellers himself was holding when he talked about the synthetic a priori as a conceptual framework relative notion. It's very similar to Friedman's dynamics of reason. And then, of course, I think you need to do something like that to be a sympathetic uh, Kantian today because you, you, you do need an account of conceptual change and yet what these, what this so-called conceptual objective correlationism is across those, those frameworks. And um, so I was with you when you were saying all that and, um, oh yeah, so yeah, Kant seems to hold that there's something necessary. Well, when you look at what he holds is necessary, I mean, you can just look at the second analogy. You can read Ken's article in his uh, chapter in the new book on Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, a critical guide that's coming out with some great stuff in it. Uh, it's, this, you know, it's the sort of thing the second analogy argues for, which is controversial, but, but is what Kant holds and Sellers holds, right? That there's no cognition of the here and now which doesn't in some way lawfully and modally situate it within the there and then. That is, you don't have cognition of the isolated empirical of the moment without already being in some kind of framework of lawfulness. Now, that's a very specific kind of conceptual analysis that Kant and Sellers defend across these frameworks. Now, what happens to it when you get open-ended object ontologies that are largely chaotic, say? Well, that's where it does become important, I think, that, as you said, at each stage, you have to account for, and as Mayasu is trying to do, account for the appearances as they were lawfully conceptualized within the predecessor framework, and then explain why really, that is the later framework, they're only relatively stable relative to what's really the case. But in each of those, you would be making, we're never doing what Mayasu says, we're trying to predict that the same laws, I mean, what, all that we do is say one thing, anything you're perceiving is against a framework of some lawfulness or other, that involves modal claims, a law, you know, and that's it. That's, that's what the necessity is, such that if you deny it, you may as well just have chaos, which, which um, it, that's a different sense of chaos than the sort that's generated but by... Keep quiet about it, please. It, it, I mean, about... If, that, if you don't have that, you can't F it either. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's why Mayasu maybe has to go his very indirect route to how things are effable. But So I think I agreed with everything you said, except then to point out that when Kant's talking about the necessity of physical laws, it's, it's very different than what Mayasu's talking about. It has to do with this one kind of condition that's highly abstractly stated, that to perceive anything, this is a commitment. I mean, non-Kantians deny this, and it's, a good, it's interesting. To be a Kantian is to agree with something like this that you don't get cognition of, of a sensible object here and now without that cognition being conceptually informed by some background or other of modal lawfulness, of necessity. Doesn't, but you're not claiming that nature is saturated with the necessity all the time. You're not claiming what the actual and natural laws are. You're not claiming any of these, you're not even making, uh, you're not providing an answer to the problem of induction in that, although you're 
doing something that's necessary for the possibility of any. Kant then goes on to talk about empirical hypotheses and so on. Yeah, Taylor. So this is a kind of a large question just about the whole dialectical space mm. here. So the idea is, and I, I agree with, I'm new to Mayasu also, and I'm trying to get a sense of what correlationism is and who's a correlationist and who isn't and why. And so I think it's hard just reading the book, at least the first time, to get a sense of the definition of that term and how it applies. So I take it your main point is to say, look, there's a kind of correlationism in Kantian empirical realism, mm -hmm. which is benign because it doesn't keep you from being a scientific realist. Mm -hmm. And it may not be any kind of obstacle to the realism that Mayasu himself wants. Right? Uh, maybe, yeah, unless maybe. he's what I call an epistemically unhinged one, which just means yes that he doesn't have a good, but, but as I say, most yeah. analytic philosophers are epistemic, so I don't mean to be, yeah. I say that from a position of minority. I get you. Yeah, it's one, so, yeah. But it, but it needn't be an obstacle to realism of the sort we, whoever might actually want. Right, it, it, it's, yeah. Okay, but there's an elephant in the room, which is that mm. for Mayasu's purposes, surely, mm. whatever correlationism turns out to be, yeah. uh, for Mayasu's purposes, Kant is a correlationist in a pejorative sense right. because he's a transcendental idealist, um, presumably. I mean, whatever, so in other words... Well, mo, mo, well, I think there's good parts of Mayasu that don't totally depend on just the things about transcendental idealism that I want. I mean, I think he's got things, well, let's just take the thing about chaos and the A deduction. I mean, Mayasu's making some interesting arguments. Forget about transcendent. So, so I try to say there are some things yeah. in Mayasu that object the conceptual correlationism, without being a debate about right. transcendental idealism. But and maybe my Mayas reading of Mayasu yeah. is too crude so far. Mm. But it seems as if he's pitting himself against a kind of knee-jerk idealism. Yeah. Right. Uh, that well, nothing you can say is going to have any sort of. Um, uh, realist credentials because it's all from um, you know how things show up to us and givenness and and I, I mean I don't know whose view that is but but it seems like a lot of his argument mm. is anticipating a kind of um, interlocutor who's well let me just let me come back to my point about Tom. well let me just comment on that yeah. because I, I find both in Mayasu yeah I mean like in that chapter one or whatever it is on the ancestral and then apparently there's stuff that wasn't in the first French edition where he's responding to criticisms. You know, he, I find him pretty sophisticated uh, in, in, because let's face it, um, the Kantian correlationism that I defend is viewed by, let's say, most analytic philosophers as, as having a foul odor of anti-realism yeah. about it. No matter how I try to clean up Kant and <laughs> Sell, Sellers' view yeah. as overly conceptually constructive. No one's a scientific realist in Seller's way. They all went Putnam and uh, yeah. the causal theory of reference way. So I just want to say, the good bits in Mayus Sue are where I think he is raising a real problem about how hard it is to be a conceptualist even of the good kind I want to say and say that yeah. that's okay. I see. So yeah. maybe what I'm going to say is just sort of obvious, but Kant, I was going to say the elephant in the room is that from Kant, space and time are just the forms of our intuition. Yeah, but not in a way that entails that there couldn't have been space and time before there were people for Kant. I mean, when I teach Kant in second year philosophy, which is a hard task, I mean, I say, I say, look, Kant, the guy who talked about, speculated about the origin of the solar system before there were humans, isn't saying there wasn't, you can't say there wasn't space and time before there were humans. He's saying these, um, any intelligible notion of space and of a world that we or anything like us, what's that mean? Finite concept using sensibly receptive in general, maybe not even space and time, and then with space and time, you know, but, but he's saying... Um, Some kind of subject, though, right? I mean, that's, that's right. You, you, that, you, that's the crazy part. That's, that's right. But not us saying. humans. Okay. Okay subjects necessarily, it's, it's, it's um, any finite sensor or sorely receptive. He is, that's the, that's the tinge of anti-realism. You right. are saying, in a sense, yeah. good luck trying to say anything about ultimate reality when you don't, in these highly abstract ways, make some reference to conceptual and, and, and receptive conditions. Yeah, okay. That's true.
but it's a mistake which most students, and I'm saying sort of Mayasu in chapter one does, and I could be wrong, you know, maybe they're all right, but he, he doesn't, Kant, the historical Kant didn't think this, he couldn't say that, you know, that space and time depends on the emergence of, right? because uh, he himself thought the universe existed before there were human beings and so on. But you, you're right that it is, some people put it from the human standpoint. Yeah. I don't like to put it from the human standpoint because it's... Kant uses that phrase. Yeah, but, but the, he's very c careful to say which, you know, even with space and time, you then are talking about beings that are pretty hard to say anyone, not us. But even there, he's careful to abstract in a certain way. So... Um, have more time to talk yeah, about this. It, it is true. I like the, the transcendental aesthetic, I think, is very difficult. And, and I think you have to read back a lot of the transcendental uh, analytic into, but I think that's Kant's whole method is to do that all the time. But Lucy Lace gets annoyed at that, and she's very good, and she, she says, why don't you read the critique forward like it was written, you know? But Kant well, does rule out the idea that mm -hmm. it could turn out that the forms of our intuition just do happen to be properties of things themselves. That's, for him, impossible. No, you're right. But in the way I understand that is to assimilate that for the hankering for metaphysical realism, a God's eye point of view. I mean, what the thing in itself is, from my kind, from a theoretical perspective, is the hankering to know things in a way that would be knowing them independently of this abstractly specifiable ways of knowing them, which is the only way we, we or anyone like us can know anything. And what Kant does is say, say don't do that anymore. Take all those unconditional claims and read them in terms of the will and, and practice. And so you have, my Kant has a radically practical turn in that way. It's not, but, but, you know, Kant wanted us to do one thing. Stop talking about the metaphysics of things in themselves. So what are 80% of Kant scholars debating today? The metaphysics of things in themselves. Yeah, yeah right. I suppose, yeah, it's okay. Mm. If you reject the, the uh, understanding in terms of the phenomena of the distinction, uh, Brown also does. Mm. Um, uh, and the claim that you know the kind of the practice the initial is kind of supplanted whole scale by scientific. Yeah. Research. So what, what what do you think? So when Sellers, for instance, says uh, something in the book in scientific, and says that, and also in the, the structure of knowledge. Out that the, uh, the manifest image Or another way to put this, tell me if you'd agree, already in the manifest image, description is explanation. I mean, that it, it's, it Sellers holds quite generally that to describe isn't just to label, it's already caught up in some kind of categorization of how things are and how they behave, right? And, and so I think that holds true across the manifest and the scientific image. But science has, has won a certain primacy through its superior explanations. And then we have to look at those. So I think that why does the manifest image break down from, from within? Here's one big one, you know, in, in um, one of them is the color argument. But I'm not convinced 
that we need Sellers' way of being an improved explanation of common sense color explanations. There are other ways that don't entail as radical a move. But it is a tough problem. But I'd see Rosenthal, and not that I'd buy his one, Paul Coates. All of these people are investigating ways in which you could improve and correct the manifest image account of color cognition in a way that doesn't entail having to um, having to have space go analogically with color analogically in a way, way that entails you to sit, have to say there is no longer a manifest persisting uh, object. So, but here's one that I, th I think another example Sellers gives is how mind, uh, kind of mind first ontologies are characteristic of the manifest image. You know those passages where he says, oh, the, the last special stand of, the last stand of special creation is that human thinking and self-consciousness is a whole that comes prior to its parts. And I think he's saying the manifest image and the perennial philosophy ha always are going to end there. And I think he's right about that. And wh why does he think the manifest image breaks down at that point? I think he thinks because you need a, an explanation, in this case a satisfactory explanation, of how conceptual thinking came to be and what it is, which I'd see him doing in evolutionary terms, you know, like in meaning and given, as givenness and uh, MGEC, he says, um, one thing is explain things this way. Another thing is we need a causal explanation of how conceptual thinking came to be in the first place through the evolution of language. Now that's the thing, if you just stick within the manifest image, you're always going to have mind first ontologies of a McDowellian kind. McDowell's the hero of the manifest image on that problem. But I'm with Sellers that more needs to be explained, that that isn't inadequate. That, that we can do better, as Sellers puts it in, the, in Empiricism philosophy. Yeah, so, so I think I agree with you, and then I'm, I'm breaking it down to both MI and SIU description is explanation. Sellers' view is that science has earned a, prior, a, a superiority to that. I agree with that, but I think in which domains are you talking about, for what purposes, what problem? And I'm not sure you can generalize a priori where replacement ontologies is the way to go, which, is, but with Peter I'm willing to map that as far as I can take it, because those are the most beautiful scientific explanations where you can really but um, I, I'm not prepared a priori to say that, that that's um, universally so. Yeah. Um, just to just yeah. read just a quick clarification from the you're describing objective correlationism. Yeah. Frequently describing it in terms of abstraction. Or, uh, that's Kant's method yes. for, yeah. I work with it, and then in the talk you specifically split abstraction from reification in some way. Right. So not abstract, but not reified. Right. Right. Good. So, right. So, and a nice example is um, the embodied thinking self. So, a lot of people read Kant. So, the way I read Kant is, um, so you, you, an easier one might be this. You can conduct certain arguments just about time and not talk about space. Then it could turn out that another necessary condition for that same kind of cognition must require space and then maybe motion in space and then maybe principles of attraction you know you see what I'm saying the first one might be just something about if you're going to have any objective cognition of a hap of a happening in time it has to be against the background of some rules of lawfulness in general second analogy but what Kant does is embed within that a series of nested necessary conditions that get more and more empirically contentful. It, it has to be in space, not just sequence in time. It has to be, well, there, it better be of some empirical kind and lawfulness or other. That's the appendix to the dialectic. It better be in a nature that's purposive regulatively. That's the third critique and the appendix, et cetera, et cetera. Same with the moral philosophy. You can say something very abstract about doing the right thing for its own sake and what sorts of principles that involves without talking about the development of your feelings into a character that generally does the right thing. But I think Kant has that Aristotelian view of virtue, but it comes as a much later demonstrated necessary condition. So the abstract 
is when you prove something at a certain level of abstraction that doesn't mean the subject is denuded from the things that you'll go on to prove are also necessary conditions of it. Does that make sense? It means that, uh, yeah. It's, it's my way of accounting for transcendental conditions as abstracting from various further conditions that, could also, that are also demonstrable as necessary conditions. You, you see what I mean? Yeah, but it doesn't mean like highest generality or whatever, like ramification. Yeah, I think if you went on to say Kant's transcendental self is disembodied in some respect because of his arguments about the I think. Uh, there are some respects in which Kant has some, but no, not for that reason, right? Kant, you shouldn't include, conclude from Kant's arguments and the transcendental deduction that the self is in any respect disembodied, I say. So, right. Transcendental condition brings in a little more about what you're showing and why and, and, and so on, but you're right. That's, I'm sorry. I think people take, a, they read the groundwork to the morals and they read first critique, and you get a Kant who can't account for empirical concepts, who's totally naked of any feelings and is generally a jerk, you know, he might have been, <laughs> um, and so on, but I think that's from not seeing how it's supposed to work. We should end it now. That's great, thanks. <laughs>